Intel has undergone a fundamental transformation from a PC-centric company to a data-centric company. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Brian Krasenich. Good evening. So today is a day where we all come to together to celebrate the lifeblood of our amazing industry. And that's really about innovation. But before we start, I want to take a moment to thank the industry for coming together for another purpose, to address the recent security research findings reported as Meltdown and Spectre. In the collaboration among so many companies to address this industry-wide issue across several different processor architectures has been truly remarkable. And security is job number one for Intel and our industry. So the primary focus of our decisions and discussions have been to keep our customers' data safe. As of now, we have not received any information that these exploits have been used to obtain customer data. And we're working tirelessly on these issues to ensure it stays that way. The best thing you can do to make sure your data remains safe is to apply any updates from your operating system vendor and system manufacturer as soon as they become available. For our processors and products introduced in the past five years, Intel expects to issue updates for more than 90% of them within a week, and the remaining by the end of January. We believe the performance impact of these updates is highly workload dependent. And as a result, we expect some workloads may have a larger impact than others. So we'll continue working with the industry to minimize the impact on those workloads over time. When we come together like this, there are endless possibilities. And I'd like to share some of those possibilities now with you. Data will redefine how we experience life in our work, at home, in school, even how we enjoy sports and entertainment. And I want to show you how we use our expertise to deliver this immersive media tonight. This breakthrough combines artificial intelligence, advanced camera technology, and millions of HD images to blur the lines between reality and imagination to create something known as volumetric video. So now let me give you some insight into how this all works, because it comes in a variety of flavors. One of those technologies is Intel True VR which is already making an impact in sports globally and will continue to transform fan experiences. It also extends beyond sports and will increasingly affect how consumers will interact with the content in all kinds of experiences. With True VR, we place multiple cameras along one side or around the perimeter of a playing field or even on a downhill ski run. Each of these cameras has multiple lenses that allow us to have 180 to 360 degree stereoscopic view. The individual cameras are stitched together with sophisticated software and powerful computers. It allows a fan to not only use their headset to look around the field, but also choose the camera position they want. Now we also have a technology that some of you may know by the name of FreeD. We are now calling this Intel TrueView. And this technology takes a very different approach. To deliver this experience, TrueView involves the installation of dozens of high definition 5K resolution cameras positioned around the entire viewing area. This allows us to define the 3D space and volume of the area inside the camera ring by dividing it into billions and billions of data points that we call voxels. Okay, so what is a voxel exactly? Well, think of it as a pixel that's placed in three-dimensional space that adds depth to the content you're capturing. 
By recording a scene this way, we effectively have the ability to take the viewer inside the 3D space of the scene from any angle he or she wants. Now, of course, it takes a tremendous amount of computing power to do this. The setups we've created to deliver TrueView for the National Football League, they produce data at the rate of three terabytes per minute. Three terabytes. That means we're creating the data equivalent of all of the text in the Library of Congress in the first quarter of any football game. Let me take you into a glimpse of the future, show you what watching sports would be like if we had multiple data streams. So I invite you and your audience to join me in my VR headset. I'm headed to Arrowhead Stadium. I'm gonna watch the Kansas City Chiefs take on the LA Chargers. So now I put on the game here. Now the first thing you notice, you have this game on the giant screen above you. Right now it's 195 foot and you can see the entire field. But you also see a little blue square and that's actually the view I have in my headset. Now, if you're watching this at home on your HD screen, you would have almost that exact same view. But look at all the data that's outside that little blue square. I mean, all that data has to be constantly updated and refreshed, so when I move my headset, I have a seamless view on the, of the field. Now, when I'm watching the game at home, I'm typically always going to my tablet or my phone to check out my fantasy football team. But because I've got multiple data streams here, I've actually taken my entire fantasy football team and brought them into this game. So but what if we wanted to be right there, in the middle of the game? What you see here is that we're able to see right through Tom Brady and, and see what he sees on the field. That's a different perspective. That's a perspective that nobody else can provide you. There's not a camera in his helmet. There's not a, another system showing that. That's going inside one of those voxels and looking out from outside his helmet. Well, on this play, you're gonna see Joe Flacco from the Ravens, and he's got, as you can tell, the pocket right here, he's looking. He's got a cornerback right there in his vision, and he's got the safety. He's gotta fit this ball right in there. Don't throw this, Joe, don't throw. Oh, oh touchdown. Good job, Joe. But you know what? There's not any other technology that would show you how tight this throw was and how difficult it was for Joe. This allowed you as a viewer to really go right there and be Joe Flacco, and you could be like, I can't believe he's making this throw. There's no window there. You get to appreciate the ability of that guy at that moment. At the same time, you'll be able to go back and nitpick and be like, not a good job, Joe, <laughs> throwing it to the other guy. So let's roll the first single camera. And what you can see, it's the Western scene. They're fighting. The hero breaks free, gets on the horse, and rides away. Now, I want to show you that same scene the exact same scene, captured volumetrically. Now, the important thing to remember is that we shot this scene only one time. And now we have all that uh, data and the ability to recreate the scene from any point of view. One of the fascinating developments is the rise of neuromorphic computing. Uh, we've been building something that truly mimics the way that the brain observes, learns, and understands. Our research efforts have produced a prototype chip called Loihi. This has been a major research effort at Intel, and today we have a fully functioning neuromorphic research chip. Our Loihi research chip is the most advanced neuromorphic chip yet developed, and after only a few weeks, it's already performing simple object recognition in the labs. This incredible technology is going to influence future products and innovations. And let's talk about quantum computing for a second. And quantum computing represents an entirely different approach to computing. This technology will be able to solve problems that are insurmountable today. Quantum computers are composed of quantum bits, or you often hear the term qubits. They use massively parallel processing to solve problems that today the best supercomputers will take months or even years to resolve. Today, 
I'm proud to show you the next step. I'm proud to introduce to you our 49 qubit quantum chip. This 49 qubit chip pushes beyond our ability to simulate and is a step towards quantum supremacy. We want to build a platform that allows autonomous cars to become a reality, from commercial fleets to passenger cars everywhere on the road. This isn't just an experiment, it's a path to the future. I saw no hands on the wheels, but this doesn't look like the traditional uh, autonomous car. There's no big lighter on top. There's, it just looks a little bit cleaner and smoother. Well, first, I'm proud to introduce our, one of our first vehicles out of a fleet of 100 cars that we announced last year. And indeed, as, as you said, all the sensors are very discreet. We have cameras, wing cameras and side cameras that give you half a sphere on the side, a rear camera, and then four parking cameras, altogether 12 cameras, and then radars and, and ladders for uh, redundancy. So we, we have identified four areas that we are addressing to make autonomous vehicle real. First is sensing, and that includes all the high performance uh, computing, then mapping, driving policy, which is about planning decisions and merging into traffic, and then models that provide safety uh, guarantees, which are coordinated with the uh, government regulations. The Volocopter is an entirely novel type of vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. It offers unprecedented levels of safety, is extremely simple to fly, quiet, and when running on its batteries, emission free. It is not some distant sci-fi fantasy. The Volocopter is real and already exists today, as you just saw in the video. I can attest to that. Now, soon we will offer autonomous air taxi flights as a service in cities across the world revolutionizing the way we all experience urban mobility today. And the best about it, it has the potential to be affordable for all of us. Uh, no, I, I agree, and, and that Volocopter uses the same flight control technology that the Falcon 8 Plus drone that Intel makes uh, uses for inspections and surveys and mapping. So it's got a lot of other uses and, and uh, reliability testing. So, but why do you think autonomous air taxis are gonna be adopted by consumers? Why, what's, what's gonna drive this to people? Well, who wouldn't like to fly across city? Sit in a volocopter, look at it from an entirely new perspective, skip traffic, save time. So, to fly drones at this scale, what we need are batteries with very high energy density. And also we need the capability of processing vast amounts of data in milliseconds especially when flying autonomously. And that is where you come into play. So with Intel inside, tech is now able to perform this task because it is powerful, small, and lightweight. They want to see it fly, don't you? OK, we'll make it happen. As I already started, you know, flying a volocopter inside the theater, live on stage, does come along with some challenges. So in order to pull off that stunt, we had to put some safety measures in place. But I'm confident you will still be able to enjoy it and get a feel for it. OK, let's let it fly. I'd like to introduce to you our newest drone, the Intel Shooting Star Mini. Everything it does is made simple and possible by data. Now, this is not the type of drone you can buy in a store. The hardware is a completely new design, so it can be safely flown and navigate indoors where there is no GPS. It has the most advanced software and is fully automated. And a single fleet of 100 drones can be controlled by one pilot. I really hope you enjoyed the new member of our family. Have a wonderful evening and enjoy CES 2018.